Hey everyone, welcome to the Bio Breakthroughs Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is Simon Allen, the CEO at Anabuelo Pharmaceuticals. Did I say that right, Simon? It's not an easy one to pronounce, a nebulo pharmaceuticals, but- uh, A nebulo. Yeah. I'm going to keep that in because I think people need to know that I messed it up the first time. That uh, really, <laughs> a nebulo. I have it now. Perfect. Well, no super worries. excited to have you, Simon. Why don't things off and, and tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Oh boy. So I've, I've loved biotech all my life. I'll try to keep it short. I'm Australian born, Australian educated, but there was no biotech in the late 80s, early 90s. And I was fortunate enough to make my way to California and hooked up with a company called Gilead Sciences, which many people now know because it's a multi-billion dollar farmer. But uh, when I joined, it was less than 50 people. I was working behind the bench uh, on the biochemistry side, running cell-based assays and whatnot. And uh, Realize at some point that I either do a PhD or move into the business side of things. And as you might imagine, I moved into the business side, did an MBA. And then I've been for the last couple of decades, really focused on what I call sell side biotech business development, which is kind of a fancy way of saying I'm a salesman. And that's good. I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that because I've been able to put many different assets, many different opportunities, therapeutic drugs is what we do and put them in the hands of big pharma um, because they may not be the most efficient or at least risk averse to do the type of stuff that we tend to do, which thank goodness for the United States, we have a system here where people put significant capital down on relatively risky bets. Uh, I'm not saying that's a nebula because we're a phase two right now, which is actually late stage, um, but that's it. That's what I'd love to do. And and how did those past experience, right? Obviously being at Gilead with less than 50 employees, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, how did those past experience lead you to this this current position? How, how have they helped in your current role as CEO? Well, on the personal side, it made me realize that uh, working at the lab wasn't the best use of my time. It's the way I thought I could contribute to the healthcare system. But it really taught me about team. And imagine a circumstance where you were lucky enough to fall into what has become an incredibly successful company. You reflect on that and really think like, what, what made that company tick? What really happened there? And I try to emulate that at every opportunity that I've had the fortune of representing. So that to me is, is one of the seminal moments in, in you know, my, my development. And the, the company today, you're really focused on developing therapies aimed at addressing acute cannabinoid intoxication, or you call it ACI. Can you provide an explanation of what ACI is? I, I tend to believe it's one of the fastest moving social issues that no one seems to be talking about. And that is the deregulation, uh, decriminalization approval, if you will, of um, highly potent cannabinoid products or dispensaries all around the country. And everybody's focused on the opioid crisis, and, and I am too. I mean, it's an awful thing with what's happening with fentanyl. And yet there's something that's under the current, that's under the radar, and that is what happens when you allow highly potent, very dangerous in certain circumstance products into the general population. And fentanyl is used by a very small percent of the population, and it causes a big deal. Cannabinoids, or cannabis, if you will, is used by a far greater percentage of the population, is becoming kind of mainstream right now. And yet nobody seems to be thinking about the true impact of it, which is fascinating to me because everybody's focused on the money. You've got the government taking the tax. You've got the cannabis industry clearly trying to compete and, and make a profit. Well, what's happening in the emergency department? Like what happens when people take too many edibles or too many cannabinoids or even synthetics too, which has always been a plague on our society. And somehow that's getting lost in the shuffle. So that's what we do here at a nebula. We're trying to, I think we're going to, but right now, all I can say is we possibly might have the first FDA approved, what I call quote unquote, Narcan for cannabis. So when you have too much cannabis, or unfortunately it might've been laced with a synthetic and you go to the emergency department, we hope to be able to treat you just like Narcan treats opioids. Interesting. And in terms of current treatments for ACI today, what do those look like? And continuously, like, I guess, as a part two to that question, what are, what is the need for some other options as well? Well, I like to talk about treating the symptom or the cause. 
And right now, there is no FDA-approved therapy for treating acute cannabinoid intoxication, which is a fully defined uh, indication under DSM-5, which is like the psychiatrist Bible as to how you think about people presenting at the emergency department. And all we can do is treat the symptoms. So if you're familiar with what an ACI patient may present as, uh, they've got a, a very high level of anxiety. They've got um, a very rapidly beating heart. And that's the first thing that physicians tend to treat, which is a beta blocker for your tachycardia, the heart beating fast. And for anxiety, or give them a benzo. That's a, a classic thing that a physician does. But what we're missing in that equation is two things. We're treating a symptom, not the cause. We'll get to that later. And the fact that even though you don't die, I mean, there were reported cases of people dying with cannabinoids, especially the synthetics. But I think we all know that if you had to choose your poison of choice, you would choose cannabis over fentanyl if you were thinking about safety of your life. But the message doesn't stop there. It's the patient outcome of a very large population and the pharmacoeconomic impact of what it costs our system to take care of all of this. So I mentioned all of the people making money. Well, what they're not sort of subtracting out of that is, yeah, but what's the healthcare system have to pick up at the end? Like, what, what's the broken glass we have to walk over? And that is a staggering amount. Can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, you mentioned without saying it a little bit earlier, your lead candidate for treating ACI, uh, it was ANEB001. How does that work? And, and give us a, a review of, of that lead candidate. Maybe I'd like to call it 007 for obvious reasons, but it's our first product, so we call it 001. And this is where I'm truly excited. I've had the opportunity to represent some, a good number of therapeutics in development. And I can honestly say that 001 has a very clear mechanism of action, how it works. And this was known decades ago. So I'd like to say I'm a big innovator and we found something you know, super cool and super sophisticated. But actually, I learned about this in the late 80s when I was you know, getting educated and what's biotech all about. So this is a small molecule that hits the CB1 receptor. The CB1 receptor is highly expressed in your brain. And when you ingest or smoke or take other forms of THC cannabinoids, they tend to go straight to the brain and bind to the CB1 receptor in your brain. And if you have just the right amount, a lot of people would say that's a good thing. If you have too much, it overloads the receptor and leads to acute cannabinoid intoxication. So 001 is an antidote, in my opinion. It's a therapeutic under FDA. But what it does is goes to the CB1 receptor and binds really tightly. It blocks it. So it doesn't matter how much THC or cannabinoids you have circulating. I would like to think that 001 is stronger and better, and it binds to the CB1 receptor. And here's the important differentiation. It does the opposite, if you will. Not only does it block, but it antagonizes. It's a fancy word for saying shut down. And so that's what we do. And I got to say, if you look into the details, what's fascinating to me is everybody says, oh, I know that's how it works. I mean, clearly that's what it's going to do. And so I, I jumped at the opportunity when I first found out about it to have an efficacy pathway that's so simple, so clear, sophisticated, it's obviously a complicated word for it being too complicated in my mind. This is not that complicated, but there are challenges in its development. I, I wouldn't want to say there's not. What, what is the impact, Simon, that synthetic uh, cannabinoids are having on say, ACI? I know you, you just talked about your lead candidate, uh, even, even broadly, and I know what's, where do you see things heading? I think there's two levels of danger, Jared. And the first one, which you mentioned, is the synthetic cannabinoids, which is very smart chemists and biologists getting together and saying, well, Delta 9 is good. It does a certain thing. How do we make it better? And unfortunately, with the technology at hand, we can make it a lot better. So these molecules, I would actually put into that opioid fentanyl class because they're designed to be far more active far a stronger binder to the CB1 receptor and can cause a lot of trouble. We're talking about, you know, sort of a nuclear option here with regards to the THC 
cannabis industry. Thankfully, it's not a huge issue in the sense that you, know, you look at the fentanyl side of things and that's a far greater issue. But that to me is an opportunity because synthetic cannabinoids can still kill and they still cause irreparable damage. And if I it presented to the emergency department inadvertently or advertently, I don't think anybody takes it on purpose, or at least that's not what I would think people would do, but it happens. And I point you to the NEDS database. This is a federal survey that has 5,000 people a day presenting at the emergency departments around our country with some form of cannabinoid intoxication. Think about that for a second, 5,000. So let's talk about the patient outcomes, what happens to those individuals, and more importantly, what's the impact on the healthcare system? Where in our estimation by third-party research, if you present at the emergency department with a cannabinoid intoxication, whether you like it or not, it's not something people wish for, it costs the healthcare system as much as five to $8,000 on average. And if you're one of the unfortunates that took a really strong synthetic, you get escalated in some cases to the psychiatric ward for long-term follow-up, long-term as in days and days. You know, the United States, our healthcare system can get kind of expensive. That can be as much as a $50,000 hit to the system. And no one's talking about it. It's fascinating to me that no one's talking about it. So at Anebulo, we're developing this antidote that hopefully works in a similar mechanism to Narcan, the fentanyl and opioids. We can take it off the table, get that individual out several hours earlier, save them the horrible patient outcomes or even the discomfort and the embarrassment and say, look, don't worry about it. We've got you covered. And it doesn't cost the system that much money. And in terms of Simon, what's next for, for you and a Nebulo moving forward? What is, I know you can't tell us everything, but what, what does that look like? Uh the future. That's right. So as I said, we're a relatively late stage opportunity here. We're not in the preclinical setting and uh, trying to move chips on the table. What we've done is taken a very well recognized mechanism of action. And it's now in phase two. We had the phase two data that was released, final phase two data. And if you're familiar with the path at phase three is the last sort of clinical stage. And then you're talking about registration and approval. And so what we've disclosed is that the uh, phase two data is finalized with part A and part B, and that we have a FDA outcome in July, and our guidance hasn't changed. Well, obviously we're in August right now, where we have the opportunity to discuss with FDA, okay, this is what we have, this is the data. What do you think we need to do in order to get approved? What is the registrational part? And we're very excited to be able to update the market when we've uh, had that information, reviewed it and set a course. So in the very near future, what I hope to come back and say to you is, is that not only have we done our phase two, but we now know what our registrational path looks like and hopefully get to market so that we can address the patient outcomes and pharmacoeconomic impact. Well, Simon, I'm really excited for, for you and your team, and hopefully we can have you come back on in the near future. We can dive into some more about the business, but congrats on all the progress thus far and you know, wishing you the best of luck. Much appreciated. Look forward to talking to you soon.